O Lord, grant us wisdom to recognize the treasures you have stored up for us in heaven, that we may never despair, but always rejoice and be thankful for the riches of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, last week we started um, Job's dialogue uh, as he's now going to have a couple of, uh, a few chapters of responses. Um, and you could say a little bit of a defense of what's going on, maybe a little bit of a summary of his viewpoint. Um, and then uh, we'll see if we can get into uh, Elihu's uh, speeches into chapter 32. But we're actually, we left off uh, in chapter 30. And let's continue on with verse 9. Job again is speaking and kind of lamenting and says, now, And now I have become their song. I am a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me. Because God has loosed my cord and humbled me, they have cast off restraint in my presence. On my right hand, the rabble rise. They push away my feet. They cast up against me their ways of destruction. So again, Job is lamenting. Remember, he's... Um, uh, you could say, uh, suffering with a lot of bodily uh, ailments, uh, and people are basically ridiculing him. And we do that as a society, unfortunately. If we see someone who is poor or someone who is underprivileged, we often take advantage of them. Remember, Job was very, very wealthy. Now, all of a sudden, he lost all his wealth, he lost his health, and now, instead of having tons of friends, he have, you, you could say, tons of enemies. So he describes himself as he's a byword to them, you know, kind of almost like a song you would sing uh, to your kids and saying, uh, whatever you do, don't grow up to become like Job, kind of like. Uh, since next week we are talking about uh, the day of ascension, and I thought it was just very interesting, uh, on verse uh, 12, uh, he puts... On my right hand, the rabble rises. And so as we talk about that day of ascension, of Jesus being at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, we sometimes think of that as a physical location instead of a position of power and authority. Okay? Because now we have to ask, on Job's right hand, was the rabble rising up? And the answer was no. You just had Job being surrounded by three, and we'll find out soon, a fourth friend, okay? Uh, but it is a way of describing uh, society's reaction to him. And for Job's authority, you could say, was diminished before he was powerful, you could say, because he was successful, he had affluence, now he has nothing, and so instead of power, instead of good people at your right hand, so to speak, now he has the rabble, per se. Again, not necessarily a position of location, but a position of authority. Likewise, when it comes to Jesus, being at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, is that that is a position of authority, because Jesus also promises to be with us always to the end of the age, and he promises to be uh, with us as, as we receive uh, the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. So obviously, yes, God can be in all places at all times. Uh, that is not an exact location per se. Uh, so again, just a little bit of a, a note to that, especially as we deal with the ascension. Yes, Hilda. Because of what ha has happened to Job there, mm -hmm. I think God... You hate to look at it that way. Nobody wants to experience what he experienced. But God is giving him an opportunity to see what it's like on the other side. Ooh. The people who don't have much, who have never had much, he has been wealthy. He's been blessed by God. And he has a good heart. But he has never truly experienced the kind of life someone who has hardly anything experiences. Now he does. So when he gets pulled up from God and blessed again, he has a whole new perspective about the world and people in it. Well, what's interesting about that line of thought 
is uh, A, Job chapters 1 and 2 describe this as a time of testing for Job mm -hmm. and mostly a time of testing for Satan because God always, in the divine counsel, God was saying to Satan, have you not considered my servant Job? And Satan's like, well, you've blessed him. Okay, that's why he's remaining faithful. And so then you had God saying to Satan, well, take away his blessings. Well, then the same dialogue occurs again. Well, because he, he still has his health. Well, okay, take away the health. Um, so in the initial chapters, you have um, this whole scenario being set up as a time of testing. Okay, and um, also um, uh, the first couple chapters does describe Job as very, you could say, faithful to God, okay? So did Job really need a, quote, major change of heart? Now, to be fair, God does indeed test everyone. Uh, and that's one of the key points we need to remember. Our time of testing will come if we haven't had been through it already. And there might be even more testing. Okay, but again, to see something from another person's perspective is always a very good thing. So I'm not going to disagree with the ideas after his, when we get to the end, that Job might have a better appreciation, especially for the poor and for the needy. But he'll actually get a hold of those concepts a little bit later on. So let's continue to kind of dive into <laughs> this chapter because he, he will talk about his relationships with his spouse, with his uh, workers, uh, and with the poor and the sojourners a little bit later uh, before we get to Elihu's uh, speech. But let's continue on with verse 13. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. Again, this is Jobin referring to those who are kind of attacking him. Uh, they need no one to help them. As though a wide breach they come, uh, admits the crash they roll on. <laughs> Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued by the wind and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. Mm -hmm. so, so Job is giving the picture that, you know, as soon as something bad happens, it's almost like the world wants to pounce upon you. Mm -hmm. As soon as you show any sort of weakness, the world is looking at trying to devour you. So now comes the challenge for us as Christians. Do we always have to present ourselves strong? And be careful with that because when you hear about Moses, Moses is described as very a man who is extremely meek. Okay? And so always presenting oneself as very strong may not always be the best uh, course of action. But I will admit, uh, if you're strong, the world may not challenge you as much either. But let's continue on, uh, because now there's going to be an interesting little, I, I don't want to say shift, but he's just going to add a little bit more to this. Verse 16, and now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With great force, my garment is disfigured. It binds me about like a collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. So as he's in the midst of this agony, and he's truly in agony, um, he makes a good connection here that we need to talk about is as, and remind ourselves as God created us. He created us with a body and a soul, and the two are connected, and we lose sight of that connection. So when we are facing physical ailments, does this also affect our soul? The answer is yes, especially as we hear about this from from Job. Likewise, when our soul is distraught, does this also affect our body? Again, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, notice um, uh, some of the poetry that he uses. The pain that gnaws me takes no rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if you've ever had that nagging pain that just never goes no. away. I don't think you have been. Okay. Um, but, but then when he gets to... Um, Verse uh, 19, God has cast me into the mire, okay? And you're like, okay, 
is this is a time of testing to be fair yep uh but he does realize that this is above divine influence this didn't this did not just happen by quote unquote chance as a lot of people in today's world like to uh, articulate uh and i have become uh, like dust and ashes well as we are reminded in genesis from dust we are to dust we shall return uh, so again, just uh, keep all this in mind. Let's continue on with verse 20. Uh, Job then says, I cry to you for help, referring to God, and you do not answer me. I stand and you only look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it, you t and you toss me about in the roar of, a, of the storm. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all the living. Hmm. So let's first start with uh, verse 20. I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. Some good parts to all of this. <clears throat> Job is still praying. And this is one of the things that we need to continue to teach, that in the midst of this type of devastation, we don't get consumed by the devastation and get disconnected from God. So Job is still praying, and so which I want to say, amen. Continue to pour out your laments and your concerns to God. Why? Because if you didn't think God existed you wouldn't be praying to him, okay? Uh, so he's crying out to him for help, uh, and he comes to the conclusion, you do not answer me. I always have, I like to have a little, let's have a little fun with those words here. Maybe a better way of describing it would be, Job, are you listening? Mm. Because even though Job is in the midst of suffering, even though his health is and his uh, has been taken away from his his money, his children been taken away from him, can he still not see the sun rising and the sun setting? Can he still not see the the earth still producing its crops? Can he still not see the birds and the other animals doing what they're supposed to do? No, he's too much in pain. Right. Exactly. Yeah, he's so okay. So the when the pain really hits us, we start losing that perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I'm not really going to beat up on Job too much at this point. Okay. But I will pick up on the words and say, no, God is still active in his creation. And as we are calm and peaceful, we can see that. But when we start getting inwardly focused, especially in the midst of pain and agony, because if you are in the midst of pain, you sometimes don't care how well the dandelions are growing or not in the backyard, okay? You're just wanted that pain removed from you so that you can consider other things. Hilda? This reminds me of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. where he's praying to God, take this cup away from me. Ah, yes, the and, agony. And he doesn't. Right. Uh, your will be done. But then also reminds me of the crucifixion where he says, Father, why have you abandoned me? And I see that in the writing there with, with a Job praying to God. And God, he feeling that God's not listening to him, not going to do what he wants, and then feeling abandoned by God. Perfect. Hang on to that thought, and let me, I'm going to grab, I grabbed this from a study note from the Lutheran Study Bible, uh, which quotes Luther, but uh, the note says, Job feels that God has become his fierce and unrelenting enemy. <laughs> then the quote from Luther, uh, the fiercer our sufferings are, the greater and more wonderful are the things that are worked in the saints. It is a proof of grace and God's goodwill when they are disciplined by the cross and afflictions. You always okay. feel good after pain. When the pain goes away, you feel really good, right? Okay, but sometimes we need the pain to refocus us. 
Because uh, think of it this way. If we are so consumed in our daily lives, sometimes God has to cause a tragic event to occur to refocus us so that we offer our prayers and petitions to God and sit there and say, okay, Lord, have mercy. And so that we're set on the right paths because how else do we get refocused? Uh, so, and this is part of that theology of uh, the cross we talk about, how God will use the suffering and even the evil of this world for his own good, in the, in, for our testing, uh, for to grab our attention. Uh, but as Hilda mentioned, Jesus on the cross and Jesus' uh, words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You got to remember at that point, Jesus was bearing the sin of the entire world. And God cannot be in the presence of sinners. And so then you get that uh, beautiful statement by Jesus acknowledging, yes, God has abandoned him, so to speak. Uh, and But yet in the midst of that abandonment, in the midst of Jesus' suffering and death, as Christians, we say, what a wonderful event. Because our sins are removed from us and placed on Christ. And so again, that's still part of that whole concept of the theology of the cross or the theology of suffering. So, but Luther would probably say, in the midst of sufferings, yeah, we should realize that it's a proof of God's grace and goodwill when we are disciplined. So we would say, hey, bring on the suffering, right? No. <laughs> no. But now let me change that a little bit. Would you ever pray, Lord, increase my faith? Mm -hmm. How is your faith increased? Through trials and tribulations. When you're in fierce pain, you can remember about three or four words, and that's about it. Have mercy. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. That's the answer. You're right. Pass out. Okay. Okay, Mary. When you're in greater pain, you turn to God more. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that's why I don't just don't understand some of this. Well, okay, so take that line of thought that you turn to God more, and that's exactly what God wants for you to do is to turn to him. So you could say, as Luther is trying to say here, when pain and suffering comes, this is a good thing because you're, you're now turning to God more in prayer and that relationship is being strengthened, okay? Or it could be a bad thing and then you turn away from God, okay? So you could say it's a little bit of that opportunity of choosing the path of God or choosing a path away from God. Okay. Job was already faithful. He was already he faithful. Tested to have that, to well, God, faith. God tests the faithful. And God did allow this mm -hmm. testing to occur. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, we need to realize, again, uh, we might be tested even more. We may not. But mm -hmm. when testing comes, we continue to put our faith and trust in God. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, grouping, uh, verse 24. Yet does not one in a heap of ruins stretch out his hand and in his disaster cry for help? Did I not weep for him whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? But when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil. And never still, days of affliction come to me. Okay, so Job is lamenting again to God and saying, you know, kind of begging the question here, why are you stretching out your hand against me? And then starts some rhetorical questions. Did I not weep for, you know, those who were suffering and my soul grieving for the needy? going back to Hilda's comment a couple slides ago about, you know, a change of perspective was needy, needed. Um, yeah, well, Job was, he's saying he was considerate of them, okay? It's not the same as living it. And not the same as living it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, yes, we can still learn in our older age, okay? Uh, but then Job, again, in part of his lament, when I hoped for good, evil came. 
when I waited for light, darkness came. Okay, and now comes the test. When evil and darkness comes into our lives, are we still going to hang on to the, the promises, the many promises of God? And you could tell the struggles as he talks again about his, the inward parts. He's in turmoil, a great deal of turmoil. So let's hear more about the turmoil. Verse 28, I go about darkened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin turns black and falls from me and my bones burn with heat. My lyre is tur uh, turned um, to mourning and my pipe to the voice of those who weep. <laughs> okay, so you, you've got an illustration of your skin being darkened, but not by sunburn, so to speak. Um, but basically darkened out of... Um, Rotten. <laughs> ill health, uh, depression, anxiety, however you want to describe it. Um, a lot of internal turmoil. Is okay. This alone, uh, these are thinking of alone men. You're right. Lonely man in the midst of three friends and another companion we'll hear about in a moment. <laughs> Not exactly friends. <laughs> Not no. exactly friends. You're you right. You're right. Friends. Okay. So notice the, the music. <laughs> and is music a very important part of a person? <laughs> yes. yes. Especially in that time. Yeah. And so you have now music of mourning right. and they of weeping. songs of heritage. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. I like the companion of ostriches hiding their heads in the sand so they don't pay attention to what's going on. If you're in that much pain, that's exactly what you want yeah. to do. Yeah. Okay. Or the brother of uh, jackals. <laughs> uh, either way, it's not giving you a good picture here. Uh, again, another note from the study Bible, picking up again on, on Luther. Uh, Job did not deserve such punishments by his life, for he was God-fearing guileless and virtuous. It tends to instruct and comfort us when we learn that God often causes even the innocent to experience the most serious misfortunes and punishments merely in order to test them. When faint hearts feel the punishments, they immediately think of sin and believe that these are punishments for sin. But one must maintain that the godly experience many evils solely in order that they may be tested. Amen. Okay, so when evil comes into our lives, okay, it may be a consequence of some of our own actions, like mm -hmm. sin, fair enough. But it also may be a time of testing. But we always need to remember that when it comes to sin, Jesus bears the price for the sin of the whole world. So the price of that sin is death. As Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. So are you really paying the price of your sin? The answer is no. Maybe some of the consequences of that mm -hmm. sin, yes. But ultimately, God will use this as a form of testing. Are you going to remain faithful and believe? Hilda. Another thing, God, I think sometimes God uses people, a mm -hmm. person who's suffering, and he can turn anything that's bad into good. For instance, I just had um, a, a couple of friends of ours, 30-year-old son just died and suffered for about a year with cancer. And um, he was in a wheelchair, and he was paralyzed from the neck down. Mm -hmm. But in the hospital... He made people smile. Mm -hmm. He brought people to Christ. And every, almost everyone who met him felt love and energy that they didn't feel before. And by, through his illness, even though he was not saved, he just recently died. But he touched, in a positive way, many lives through his own suffering, but he didn't he didn't condemn God because of his suffering. He brought goodness into other people's lives. 
And that's a beautiful answer to the question when sometimes I visit with people in hospitals or in nursing homes and they say, what good am I here? And the answer, which uh, Helda just gave us, is you still are ministering or serving, even though you are being served, to those who are taking care of you. And how can you share your Christian faith with even the nurse, nurses and the staffs and the doctors who then come in around you? So you might be just be laying in the bed, but do you not have something to give to them? Uh, which and share the faith that uh, God has given to you as a gift. Can you not share it with them? The answer is yes. So don't ever sit there and say, why am I here? Okay, we may ask that question in the back of our mind, but God can, can still use you and does use you. But let's uh, move on to uh, uh, the next chapter here. You're going to get a little bit of a change of thought. Job is continuing. He says, Chapter 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Or what would be my portion? Sorry. Uh, is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquities? Does not he see my ways and number all my steps? In the, the first verse, I, I kind of like the idea, um, that idea of I'm going to make a covenant with myself. I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to stare at any uh, virgins, okay? Good. Uh, I think we sometimes do need to challenge us, ourselves and says, you're right. I'm going to discipline my body so that I do not sin, especially in whatever particular area. But we always have to realize that we are stained with sin. And there is going to always be that struggle. So making the covenant with my eyes is a good thing, but it does not save us. Only God's grace saves us. So again, we can discipline the body all we want, but we are only saved by God's grace through faith, not by our own works. Um, but then Job comes up with this, uh, he's been listening to those companions too much, <laughs> Uh, is not calamity for the unrighteous and the disaster for the workers of iniquity? Um, his friends are probably sitting there going, Job, this is what we're trying to tell you here. Mm -hmm. But uh, then notice what he says afterwards. Does not he see my ways and number my steps? Okay. And so he's like, God knows all things. And does, isn't he leading me and guiding me? So he continues on. Uh, verse four, 5. If I have walked with falsehood and my feet foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my in integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes, and if I, any spot has struck to my hand, then let me then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. So basically Job is saying, you know, if I'm such, if I'm such that much such of a bad person, then let another take my spot, okay? Let another, you know, reap the benefits of what I've worked for and stuff like that. And, you know, come Lord Jesus, come take me to be with you in paradise, so to speak. Um, so he's doing a little bit of this, um, you know, uh, okay, God, um, if you really think I'm that much of a sinner, then just take me out. Uh, but, you know, uh, at the same time, you have a little bit of a challenge to God. Let me be weighed in a just balance. He's so scary. he's feeling that he's maybe getting the short end of the stick. Okay. He's feeling um, sorry for himself. Right? You're, you're very much so. He's in a lot of pain and agony. Okay. So again, I don't want to pick on Job too much. Uh, because if I was in Job's position... Uh, I don't think I'd last as long as he did. Yeah. Okay, uh, verse 9. If my heart has been enticed toward a woman, and I have laid in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down on her. For that would be a hideous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. 
for that would be a fire that consumes as far as a badon, and it would burn at the root to the root of all uh, to the root all my increase. So he he sets up a, a little bit of a uh, a conditional, so to speak, with God and basically saying, you know, if, if I broke in the sixth commandment, I'll kind of put it that way, then take my wife away from me. Let let her be somebody else's spouse. To which I want to sit there and almost smile a little bit and going, oh yeah, Job chapter, what was it, two? <laughs> when his wife said, just yeah. curse God and die. Right. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. If someone else wants to take her. No, I shouldn't say that. Okay, never mind. Ah... <laughs> uh, but uh, never mind. But he is basically trying to say is he's been doing a good job in keeping that sixth commandment in relationship with his spouse. So each one of these slides are going to pick up a different type of relationship type issue. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to verse thirteen. Uh, if I have rejected the cause of my manservant or my maidservant, again, different part of the relationship, when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he makes iniquity, what shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? couple of points. So again, last slide, we were talking about relationship with spouse. This one, we're talking about relationship with the <laughs> servants. But very interesting key point. Did not he who made me in the womb make him? What a beautiful way for us to realize and to look at our neighbor. Did not God make them? Yes. Okay. And did not one fashion us in the womb? Yes. God did create us. So how we interact with our fellow human beings is extremely important. They are also part of God's creation. What's the answer to that question? What shall I answer it? Um, it, These are kind of rhetorical questions. He's doing a lot of lamenting to God, okay? And as we kind of covered before, if, it, if he's in a lot of pain, is he really listening to for God's answer? Okay, but again, it's, it's kind of fun to unpack a little of these rhetorical questions. But yeah, Job's right. The same God created them and created him. And so he's basically saying, I've respected all human life. And that's a good thing. Verse 16, if I have withheld anything that the poor desired or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel alone and the fatherless has not eaten of it, for from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or the needy without covering, it's going to go on. In this slide, we're he's talking about the relationship with the poor, okay? The, the widowed, the, the fatherless, the orphans. And those are key biblical concepts. And he's like, I have taken care of them. Let's go on. Now, verse 20, if his body has not blessed me, and if he has not warmed, if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder and let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have, face, have faced his majesty. I want to have a little fun with the opening words of verse 20. If his body, referring to the poor and needy, has not blessed me. That's a very intriguing concept. Yeah. When we help the poor, are we not blessed? No. Yeah. Mine says his heart. Okay. And his heart did not bless me. Okay, and his heart did not bless me. Okay. So, you know, out of the heart comes the wellsprings of life. Right, right. So, basics is the same concept is God does want us to take care of other people. And when we take care of other people, we are also blessed. And then they bless others. And then they get the opportunity to bless others. You're right. 
So you, if you get the idea of we're receiving the gifts from God so that we can share the gifts of God with other people so that they can receive the gifts from God and share it with others, you're on the right path. We get ourselves into problems is when we sit there and say, all these gifts from God are for me and me alone. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Okay. I, I do have a, you know, a bad illustration for that. So my apologies, but it does kind of fit. Um, you know, we become consumers of God's gifts. And I like to call that um, uh, spiritual constipation. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> okay, I think you can kind of get the imagery there. Okay, but again, he, he goes back into the rhetorical questions about, uh, have I not helped them? If I didn't help them, then let my shoulder fall from, uh, shoulder blade fall from my shoulder, let my arm be broken. Uh, and I'm like, ouch. Isn't there I... enough wrong with them already? <laughs> yeah, isn't there enough wrong with you already? I like that. Parts store. <laughs> yes, don't we all? But he's kind uh, of a he spare has... back, a, a spare knee, a spare <laughs> foot. Yeah, okay, let's move on here. Okay, verse 24. If I have made gold my trust, or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand had found much, if I have looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor and my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges for I would have been false to God above." So in this section, Job is basically saying, did I worship other gods? And he starts by trusting gold. Good teaching point. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because we struggle with this in today's world. Oh, yeah, I don't worship any foreign gods. You're right. You're just worshiping your bank account. Okay. Uh, and Job is basically saying, no, he's still hanging on to the faith, even though all this has been taken away from him. And again, the sun and the moon gods, you could say, uh, or um, any of the uh, other idols. And he, he knows that if he had done this, he would have been false to God above. Verse 30, 29. If I have rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me, or exulted when evil overtook him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. If, if the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been filled with his meat? Okay, so here's one of the tough parts of this one for us as Christians, is what happens when we see somebody who's suffering who once caused us harm? What's our reaction? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being on this. I appreciate that. You know, case in point, you're, you're driving, you're going on a nice uh, family trip, uh, you're doing the speed limit, some car goes racing by you and your car shakes and shivers afterwards because uh, you know they're going, they're extremely fast and then 20 minutes later you see them pulled over by a state trooper and your reaction is, yes. <laughs> okay. But... <laughs> Dog. It's not just, yeah. <laughs> They're doing. It's nice to know that law enforcement's doing their job, right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> okay, so we got a little bit of that in us. We want to see justice done. We want to see that people get what they deserve, but not us when we <laughs> sin, right? Uh, so we got to be a little bit careful with that one, okay? Uh, and we we do have to be careful with our own mouth. Uh, do we ever um, curse anybody? Okay, but let's go on. Uh, verse 32. The sojourner has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do by hiding my iniquity in my heart, because I stood in the great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me, so that I kept silence and I did not go out of doors. He's continuing on with the sentence. But there's a lot to it, but let's just pull this apart for now. The sojourner, um, he's helped. He's opened the doors to the travelers. Verse 33, he now talks about concealing sins. 
as others do, okay? Now, what's interesting about the concealment of sin as others do, he gives an interesting answer, because I stood in the great fear of the multitude. And I want you to hang on to that line of thought for a moment. Why do we struggle with confession of sins? We because don't want anyone to know. <laughs> we don't want anyone to know because if they knew my sin, mm -hmm. they wouldn't want to be my friend. Mm -hmm. Oh, because I stood in the great fear of the multitude, I have concealed my transgressions. You get a little bit of that teaching point here coming out. Mm -hmm. Except for, as Christians, what are we called to do? Confess. Confess our sins. To confess. Okay, if I sin against my neighbor, I should confess, right? And he has to forgive. That works yeah. both ways. When you hear that, you feel that, well, I'm just as guilty. When you hear that. Oh, when, when, we, hear, when we confess our sins and the crowds hear, hear that confession of sin, There's you're sitting there going, that did the same thing. You're, they might be thinking in the back of their mind going, yep, yeah. I've done the same thing. Or they might be getting then judgmental. Mm -hmm. But you're right, if you're in a good Christian uh, community, uh, you're gonna, you, the community would sit there and say, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, if I'm honest with myself, I've done the same thing, which then reminds us we shouldn't be in judgment over other people. However, if we're not in a good Christian community, yeah. then people are gonna say, look, that person admitted his fault and I'm gonna judge it and hold it against him. And tell everyone else. And tell everyone. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Church. There you go. Right. Remember. Right. Okay. But let's uh, continue on here. Uh, verse 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. <laughs> Whoops. This is a little bit of a rebuke against God here. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Mm. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. To which I want to sit there and say, okay, Job, I think you're taking this a little too far. So let me try to unpack what he's trying to say here. He's basically saying, tell me what I did wrong. I will fess up to it. Okay, be careful with that. Uh, and that he would carry it on his shoulder or even wear it as a crown. So now let me ask that as an interesting question. Do we can carry our sins on our shoulder? Do we fess up and say, you're right, when I was younger, because I don't do it now, right? I did this, this, and this. Uh, no, we're going back to the previous slide, we like to conceal all that stuff, okay? But if we did, okay, I'm going to beg another question. So if I did carry my sins on my shoulder, am I doing so as a method of paying for them? By saying to the world, you know, I was once, I'm just going to make something up, was a drug dealer. And so I keep talking about me being a drug dealer and so forth down the line. Is that sin not forgiven by Christ? The answer is yes. Then why do I need to continue to wear it? Why do I need to continue to share it? What am I hoping to gain by doing that? Look what I did. Yeah. And yeah. Was it, was it you? And so I, I sometimes struggle with uh, things like this. Um, I, I don't have any problems with Christians giving their testimony, but yet at the same time, I'm just like, we all have sinned. We all have fallen short of God's glory. Um, we all have been through dark times. The Lord has saved all of us, thanks be to God. Do I really need to be wearing it on my shoulder? Mary, did you have a question? Or? Well, I was just thinking, do, do you mean confess to the world that you did something bad? whenever it was, or you're confessing to God and asking for forgiveness. That's two different things. He's doing both here. He is lamenting to God and saying, tell me what I did wrong, and you tell me what I did wrong, I'm going to wear it on my shoulder. If you're wearing it on the shoulder, you're just telling everybody of all these things that you did wrong. Yeah, keep going. But I'm thinking, would you not confess to God and ask his forgiveness? Exactly. But do you need to confess to everybody else or no. just to God? Just no, to God? I, I don't need to wear it as a badge of honor. Okay. 
Okay. My, my Bible says to confess it to people and the church and everyone else and to God. No, the, the only time that confessing to other people uh, is extremely helpful is, of course, if they are really taken back by something and the relationship is damaged. Um, but do I need to tell the whole world every single one of my sins? The answer is no. Okay. Uh, because if I actually went through a nice long laundry list of every one of my sins, I don't think anyone would show up over the weekend for church. <laughs> okay, Hilda. At the same token, if Christ, when Christ died on the cross, yes. and he died for our sins, the forgiveness right. of our sins, mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end, why then do we have to confess constantly to God about our sins? Ah, so the the confession part of uh, that is a reminder that I need a savior. Mm -hmm. You're right. You are forgiven. Okay. You are 100% forgiven for all sins in the past and even all future sins. I think there was a newsletter article last month about that. Um, you are forgiven. But what you're really doing when we come to confession is we are reaffirming that relationship as Jesus as that Savior and we as that sinner in need of God's grace, okay? Uh, so what happens if I forget a sin? You are still forgiven, okay? So must I confess every single sin? The church previously and many years ago uh, forced that upon people. And no, you are forgiven through Christ. All sins are forgiven. So the confession part is reaffirming that beautiful relationship. You are forgiven because notice what we do in the liturgy. Right after confession of sins, do we then collect an offering? Do we then sing a half dozen hymns and collect a second offering? No, immediate absolution, immediate declaration, you are forgiven. Nothing should separate confession, absolution. We even tie them together in our words and our speaking. Anything that you want to, if, as soon as you put a separation between it, warning uh, lights should be going off and flags and whistles and so forth. John? Uh, at the end of, uh, I used to be Catholic, at the end of the, your confession, you say, I'm sorry for these sins and the sins of my past life. Wow. Um, yeah, so when we confess our sins, we are referring to uh, all sins and not just things that we know we have done because, okay, but also referring to our sinful nature, okay, because we still struggle with that sinful nature. And so we talk about sins that we are aware of and sins that we're not aware of. Okay, um, and but l let me move on here. I just got a couple more slides uh, and then I get to a good break and I know my time is coming up to a, a close here. So uh, verse 38, if my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I have eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. I, I have a little note in my, in my slide here. I just thought it was just humorous as I was reading through this and preparing this. If my land cried out against me and I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear from my lawn. <laughs> you know, my lawn would probably sit there and going, you know how many weeds have been growing here and you've been letting them grow and how big they are? You know how many mulberry trees I have in my backyard, those little starts? Yeah, uh-huh. And, and then, the, do and then the, the dog droppings. How long are you going to let this one sit? It's fertilizer. <laughs> I know. Yeah, sure. I know the backyard is well fertilized. It's nice and green. The front yard is sitting there going, I could use some. Uh, and and so my lawn would have this great long list of injustices that I have committed against it. And we won't even talk about lack of watering, lack of fertilizing, uh, and if we've ever littered, you know, and so forth. I don't want to hear what my lawn would have to say against me. But now we get to the words of Job are ended. Well, they're not quite ended, but he's now had his peace, so to speak. He's still, his heart is still troubled. I want to pick up a note from the Lutheran Study Bible. Job bases his speech on the idea that moral behavior merits God's favor and that immoral behavior earns God's displeasure. 
If anyone could be justified before God based on good works, it would have been Job. But God's justice is too uncompromising, and his ways on earth are hidden. Job will learn that God has his purpose in suffering. There is no way for humans to see behind the mask of God, to know God's will apart from Scripture. He reveals his gracious will through the word, not by reason or experience. Mm -hmm. What I love about that phrase is he reveals his gracious will through his word, not by reason. <laughs> because there are sometimes we may look at God's word and say, this does not make much sense. Okay. Your ways are higher than your ways. Uh, yes. yes, his ways are higher than my ways. That is most certainly true. I do not know all things. He does. A child that is suffering through something terrible and ends up dying, that child was innocent. There's no reason for it to have been in, in man's way of thinking. Exactly. There's no reason for this child to have suffered this way. Why did God let it happen? So Job is crying about all these things that have happened to him, which I understand. He's also lived a long time and has also lived a good life. A uh, child has not done that, but yet God allows that to happen. Right. Uh, yes, we've got many instances of injustice in our world for today that by our own standard, Okay, but yet at the end of the day, can we still not say, yes, I know my God is good and continue to rely on his grace and mercy, even when there are things that occur in this world and we sit there and go, I do not understand this. So I just want to take a look at what's going to happen for next week. Uh, we just finished up uh, Job's monologue. We're going to get into uh, Elihu's uh, speeches going to be more than one. He's got five chapters of it. Wow. New speaker here. Yeah, he's been bottling it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what happens when, you know, you, someone just sort of sits there. But again, it's an interesting testimony where he sits there and he, he says absolutely nothing. Job has finally spoken his words. And now he perceives the time to say something. So we're going to get into that. And then afterwards, for, for the moment you've finally been waiting for, God's response, okay? And we're going to get uh, Yahweh's or God's uh, first speech, a couple chapters. Job has a, a little response of a few verses. And then uh, a little bit more from God and uh, the second response, and then we'll come to a, a conclusion. So uh, I should finish this hopefully within my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've been slowly going through it, but thank you for your patience. But uh, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.